Now that we learned that brevity is important, what are some tips that we can do to be even more brief? The secret to a good sermon is to have a good beginning and a good ending and to have the two as close together as possible. George Burns, he's a comedian, if you didn't know. Today, we're going to continue our conversation about the book, Smart Brevity, The Power of Saying More with Less, from Jim Vandehey, Mike Allen, and Roy Schwartz. Last week, we talked about why it was important to be brief, and hopefully it made its case that nobody has time to read what you have to say. And if they do, they're giving it partial attention, and then they're ending it at some point. So the best that we can do is grab people's attention right away and hope that they hang on for the bulk of what we're trying to say, but that we're going to use their time wisely. We're going to use our own time wisely by cutting down the things we have to say. So they're going to try to give you some tips now on how you can do this. And first of all, you have to write in order of importance. And again, that first point is the most important part. And that first point is always going to be the most important thing. Think about my tech support email. So let's say I said to my friend, Sarah, hi, Sarah, I just checked out. Your issue is a bug and it's going to be fixed in the next release. Two, this is how you can bypass this bug until the fix goes in. Three, how's your dog and your horse? We're going to put them in order of importance. We're going to turn our email upside down. So the most important thing is said first. A lot of times it used to be that emails would say, hi, Sarah, and then we go into the personal stuff. Then we would go in and say, this is the workaround. And oh, by the way, this is going to be fixed in the next, you know, no one has been hanging on to the email that long. So we know we have to turn this around. So everything is going to be written in order of importance. And I guess even for me, somehow in podcasting, I always think I'm winding up to a point. You know, this is the most simple thing. Then the middle is the most middle thing. And at the end is the big finale. Maybe I'm doing even this podcast wrongly that I tend to save a lot of the best ideas, the most impactful things to the middle or the end of the podcast. Hmm. Then it says whittle down your list and make it only one or two points. Write them as bullet points and not blobs of text. Boy, that's great. And it says no matter what we're doing, Whatever we're creating, whether it's a podcast, a sermon, an email, a Zoom meeting, we're going to try to do that. We're going to start right away with the most important thing, the thing that's going to grab people. Maybe they'll hang on for the rest of it. Same thing they say with the podcast, that if we can have our most important part right at the beginning, maybe they'll hang on for the rest of it. But if they don't hang around with the rest of it in our old way, They're going to miss the most important part because they gave up on listening on your podcast five minutes ago. Tell me if you're giving up on this podcast halfway through. I'd love to know. Then it says that you have to do a gut check. Is everything what you're saying is essential? And then start deleting things, get rid of things. And if you do that, people will be glad. They'll be glad that you spared them a great deal of reading. They will get out of your content, whether it's an email, an article, or a podcast, the thing you're trying to tell them. And they'll be happy. They'll be glad for you. And you'll be glad too, because think of all the time you saved. He gave this example of an email going out to a soccer team. And well, we should arrive by this time and go dogs. And you know they're giving this whole thing when instead it could have been two sentences long. First, the soccer tournament will be held in Springfield at the soccerplex. The boys should arrive at 1 p.m. Go Red Dogs. Very simple. Okay, it was three sentences. You can see how short that is. And so it's supposed to grab you and seduce you into maybe reading the rest. He says, quote, every word is a battle for additional time and attention. And that oftentimes they said what I said last time, some people only read the headlines. And unfortunately, the headlines don't give justice to what the actual document is about. That's very unfortunate. Six words is the optimal length of a subject headline. Hmm, There we go. So stop using too many words. Stop trying to be funny. Oh, man, I like to be funny or ironic or cryptic. I always hate the cryptic. You ever see those on Facebook where someone says, bad day, 
feel like I'm going to die. I'm now flopped on my bed and I can't even get up. And you're like, oh, good grief. You know, what happened? And then they say, oh, you know, nothing happened. I get that point that anytime you're trying to do something special, it's probably not working the way you think it is. Whether it's being funny or ironic or cryptic, it says, stop all that. Stop using fancy words. I know sometimes I can use fancy words too. And I don't do it in writing, strangely enough, but I can do it in the podcast. He says, quote, in 10 words or less, write the reason why you're bothering to write something in the first place. Make it quite clear. Again, should be interesting, provocative, short, strong words, and active verbs. Then read it out loud and confirm it sounds something enticing, you know, something that you would want to read or maybe show a friend, maybe see if they would want to read it or be interested in it. But if you're spending all this hour and all these times writing something and being dramatic and crafting your words, no one's going to see it. And unfortunately, you've probably wasted your time, I hate to say. I say, too, that sometimes those headlines can be boring. Can I bother you for a few minutes? Instead of, I have big news, you know, something like that. Oh, that's cool. Or it's going to be something that they're really dying to know something that they're really interested in. And if they don't want to know what you're going to say, are you even sure you should be writing it in the first place? It gives a good number of examples of headlines and teasers that are bad and then how it can be improved. That using strong words, strong sentences will always do better. And even if you're just writing an email, you're doing a social media post, people are wondering, why am I reading this? And should I even bother? And like I said, I'm pretty good about it. You know, I said the most important thing first and I used bullet points. I didn't even use real sentences. And the reason I did it is because I understood people were only reading so much stuff. But the other reason I did it is I'm a terrible writer. And the less I have to write, the happier I am. But now I'm even thinking, boy, I should have written even less. They even give the example of reading, of writing an email to your boss and explaining why you should get a raise and how you send this very long email. And it says, quote, I know my value and I want to discuss a raise. Short and to the point. Boy, that boils it down, doesn't it? it? Says that we should skip the jokes, telling jokes, and stick to one sentence. Don't repeat anything. Don't use weak words. And just try it. One sentence and then move on. Like he says at the beginning of this book, they just wish they could just say and then stop at the end of every chapter. We're going to frame it. We're going to make it strong. We're going to show the big picture. We're going to just give the number, if we have to give a number, and the bottom line. Instead of saying, in conclusion, we're going to say, just the conclusion. And it's important, again, because people will love the fact you just got to the point. They say that no sentence should be redundant. Instead, the emails, the blog, the social media should be asking us to want more. I want to read more about this. And I can tell on Twitter in general, when someone's really good at this, I'm like, what? I'm really interested in reading this. They talk about a concept called axiom. And axioms are from a Greek word meaning worthy. And so they mean that this is going to be worthy of your time. And you got to build that trust where people know that when you say something, it will absolutely be worthy of their time. He says, quote, axioms are like street signs. They tell you where you are and where you're going. And they give some examples of some axioms they think are effective. What's next? How to read between the lines? How to catch up quick on, you know, whatever it is you're doing. There are ways to make something strong. Like one of their axiom is by the numbers. I'm just going to give you the raw data. I'm not going to screw around with that. We live in an age of clickbait. I want to say something cryptic so that you click on my link and so I get credit for you clicking on my link. Instead, they're saying the exact opposite. Make them want more by using these axioms to grab people right away and signal that's something that they're going to want to read. And then he says there's just three parts. Your headline your first strong sentence lead, that's going to be the grabber, and then the axiom. And those three things are the only things that you should be writing. And then just stop. And if you get this right, quote, 
you will have done more in 200 words than people do in 20,000. And so I like that idea, or at least that challenge of, can I make people want more in an age where everyone wants to just get over what it is you have to say? I want to read just the bullet points. I just want to know the gist of your article. I don't have time to read your whole thing. Can you do those first three things so well they want to know more? Boy, that is a challenge all by itself. And they go back to talking about bullets and they say, quote, the golden rule of bullets. Nobody wants to stare at a clump of words and figures. If you want to explain three or more different data points or related ideas, split them up into bulleted reports. People will skim nicely separated bullet points. I I agree with that. I, I think that's why I tried to write with bullet points. One, because I'm a terrible writer and I thought I could get through a bullet point when maybe a paragraph would be harder for me to craft strongly. But this is saying people want to see bullet points. And I know I do too. I want to see the gist of what you're saying. And they say just as a rule of thumb, Shorter is always better. One syllable is better than two syllables. Strong words are better than weak words. And strong verbs are the most important thing, going along with strong one-syllable nouns. They gave examples like fire, boat, cage, or verbs, taunt, crush, chop. You know, you see all those strong words that are there. And again, they remind us not to use what they call spelling bee words because they make you just look like jerks that are trying to sound very smart by using very big, long words. I have said words like paradox and disconcerting. Oh, boy. But there are other words like vicissitude I've never said. So there's something on my side. Try to talk to real people and not use these words, but instead use those strong, single words. Then anything that would be foggy could may, might. You don't want to hear that. Foggy words are used because we're not confident. We're not confident what we're saying. So we'll say, you know, exercise, it may help you. May? It's going to help you. Of course it's going to help you. So don't use bad words just because you lack confidence. If you're lacking confidence in what you're saying, go find a way to get confidence about what you're saying. And it had an interesting part about emojis. You know, I think we're taught not to write with emojis in our emails or our professional things. But you know what? People do it. My boss uses a smiley face and I always think she's smiling at me. It does help warm up a situation if you don't know the tone of what's being said. You can put in a cake as a celebration. You can put in emojis that will represent many words. I wonder how many is too much. So I wouldn't say do it too much, but it can emote what you're trying to get out. So sometimes I use the smiley face or other types of things or when I'm laughing, when I'll say something like, gee, and wouldn't that be nice if it got fixed sooner? Smiley face. Because I wasn't being mean about that. I was just, you know, going, oh boy, huh? That's a hard issue we have to deal with. Smiley face. So you try to use an emoji in an email to express what it is you're feeling. And it can warm up a situation that might be difficult to say to someone. It says in the end that we shouldn't make our readers pick what's important. That's a direct quote. Instead, we should craft our writing or our podcast or whatever content we're doing and picking up the most important thing. You're the writer. You should know what the most important thing is. And that when we do that, we're not being selfish. We're not writing for us or to make ourselves sound great. We're writing to save that other person from having to figure out what it is you're trying to say in the first place. And they say ways to get people engaged are to, again, use those smart words. But he says, grab me, excite me, or be funny, make me smile, or create a graph or a picture that would say a thousand words instead of actually saying a thousand words. It says align people around a common value articulate what it is you're going to say. See, they just used a big word and then explain the importance of what it is you're trying to say. You can even use these tactics when you're doing presentations, creating PowerPoints, when you're talking on Zoom meetings or creating organizational charts. And for advice they give for when it comes towards like having a meeting, set a time limit. People at my work do a great job of this. If you have 30 minutes to meet, make it a 25-minute meeting. 
people will love you for it. It will give them time so they can go get another cup of coffee. They can go to the restroom. They can just go and look out a window and take a deep breath or just have a few minutes so that they'll be able to prepare for whatever next meeting they're having. They say that you could even try micro meetings, which would be five to 10 minutes long. No one says that we have to have meetings in half hour chunks. That's very smart. I like that. I wonder if you have micro meetings, if people will feel like the time was wasted or will they appreciate it that we went over something very quickly? They say too, that if you're doing this for a meeting, make sure we stay on topic while we know the meeting matters. And if anyone gets off of topic, you can guess if anyone's going to get off topic in a meeting, it's going to be this girl. But bring people back. And when there's two minutes left, it says bring the discussion to an end. Summarize the takeaways and be over with. Don't chit chat. I love the chit chat. And make sure you stick to the point. And at the very end, they give some additional ideas. Again, we're going to stick to the one point. It says hit them over the head with that point. So they walk away with one thing. I always said that about my pastor too. Like he'd always wrap up three sermons in our time. And when I talked to him, he said, well, I only have you here for this amount of time once a week. And I try to shove as much into your head as I can. I said, yeah, but the problem with it is there's three sermons usually in your sermon. Wouldn't it be better if I walked away every Sunday with that one big idea that's going to get me through a tough time challenge me to do better or inspire me throughout the rest of the week. That one idea instead of three ideas, hit them over the head with it. Said you can even make it fun. And then you're always going to reinforce that one idea. Then say thank you. People want to cheer for you and they love nice people. So thanking them is always going to be a big deal to everybody. There are tips at the end of the book about how to create a great slide deck, which means bullet points, precise words. We're going to simplify everything. We hope that pictures say a thousand words and we're going to keep it short. And at the very, very end, because I keep saying at the end, is a part about social media, about how to do Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all the different social medias a little bit better than where we've been doing in the past. They gave some guiding principles when it came to this. One, be an expert or find an expert. Two, Stay short and not shallow. Three, write like you speak. I like that. I do write like I speak and I always feel bad about it. Like I should be writing some other way. That writing and speaking are two different things, but instead they like that. And have clarity. Use style, it says, for impact. You know, using bold and bullet points to make it more readable. So I'm just going to continue with my smart brevity right now and end the podcast. My challenge to you is find one email. One thing you're doing this week and see if you can't follow these rules of brevity to make it shorter, more to the point and have more impact. All right, everyone, thanks so much for listening. Please subscribe, tell a friend and email me at Jill with startwithsmallsteps.com. And remember, grabbing people and holding them so they want to read more starts with small steps.